history flames into life as the dramatic scenes of the first landing at Circular Quay are reenacted at Farm Cove. In the shadow of a modern city, a replica of His Majesty's ship's supply rides at anchor, where the real supply was hove to on January the 26th, 1788. We see the natives gathering in corroboree to ward off the invaders, just as they then did. Keep the anchoring signal flying, Bolton. This is how white Australians celebrated 150 years of settlement, which black Australians would describe as invasion. Before Captain Phillip lands, Lieutenant Ball takes a boatload of Marines ashore to keep the natives in check. In the face of menacing savages, the white men advance up the shore of the new land. And especially as there appear to be no women amongst them, is there any likelihood of an ambush? See that no one remain skulking about. Now Philip himself lands. So a handful of Englishmen took possession of a continent, a vast, unknown, primeval land. It is now fitting that we should turn our minds to the purpose underlying this enterprise, which is to plant a fresh sprig of empire in this new and vast land. It may be that this country will become the most valuable acquisition Britain has ever made. The flag of England is hoisted again where it first flew in Australia this time watched by thousands of Australian-born citizens of the Empire. The Aborigines taking part in this reenactment were press-ganged into playing roles. They were brought to Sydney and held overnight in a police compound next to dog kennels, and they were warned that if they didn't cooperate, their food rations would be stopped. In 1988, it will be the 200th anniversary of the British in Australia. Who will play the menacing savages has yet to be decided. At the white man's school, what are the children taught? Are they told of the battles our people fought? Are they told how our people died? Are they told why our people cried? Australia's true history is never read, but the black man keeps it in his head. The greatest island on earth, Australia, is a secret country with a secret history. Now that may sound strange because Australia has always projected a very clear image of an open and fortunate society. And yet there are few countries in which an historical conspiracy of silence has been so complete as here in Australia. This was a frontier country and it still is. On one side of the frontier in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, there were the English poor and Irish political prisoners sent by Britain as slaves. On the other side of the frontier, in deepest shadow, lived a mysterious and remarkable nation whose people could trace their roots back 40,000 years. Britain waged war against this nation, massacres as systematic as those practiced against the Jews in the 20th century were carried out in the name of God, King, anthropology, money and land. The jolly swagman was not especially jolly, the billabongs ran with blood. Few or none of these events were recorded and remembered by white Australians. And as the cities grew, the descendants of the white slaves, Australians like myself, seldom glimpsed the other side of the frontier, the outback as we called it. As children, we were given to understand that we were merely innocent bystanders to the slow and natural death of an ancient people, the first Australians rather than the inheritors of a past every bit as rapacious as that of the United States, Latin America, Africa. All that was unmentionable and secret. This picture was taken at an Aboriginal reserve in the Northern Territory in 1968. Called the Palms, it was my first glimpse of what I'd never imagined, an Australian gulag beyond the frontier. How did they get away with it? In Aboriginal cemeteries, the number of children's graves is always disproportionately high. In 1983, two researchers using Queensland government statistics found that Aboriginal deaths from preventable infectious diseases in that state were as much as 300 times higher than the white average and among the highest in the world. <laughs> 
In New South Wales, a report found that almost a quarter of Aboriginal males who had survived to the age of 20 were dead by 40. These are third world statistics. A third world disease, trachoma, is widespread in black Australia. Trachoma grows ulcers on the eyes and causes blindness. Leprosy is also virulent. In recent years, the rate of new lepers has dropped by only 20% in Australia, compared with an 80% drop in Upper Volta, the poorest country in the world. Black Australians may well have the highest prison population in the world. Convictions related to homelessness, alcoholism and unemployment have meant, in effect, that to be black is a crime. In education, black children who not long ago were taught that their society was pagan are now taught to question it, while all the time being rejected by the alternative white society. Too many black Australians live in tin shelters like these, which boil in summer and freeze in winter, which have an ablution block if they're lucky and taps that seldom run. Australians give generously to Cambodia and Ethiopia, but this is not a cause. For beyond the suburbs it remains out of sight and out of mind. How the first Australians have survived and actually increased their number in recent years is phenomenal. All those can never kill the Aboriginal spirit. It can... Man has done terrible things to the Aboriginal man, the physical part of us. It has caused everything you've said it has. The degradation has been there, but that's just a reflection on the, uh, the European white ways, not the Aboriginal spirit. The Aboriginal spirit is a shining, pure spirit which still is part of, part of this. I think it is the, our greatest victory that we have hung on to our humanity. I think it is not true that we have been dehumanised in the way that so many other people peoples of the world have been dehumanized by decolonization and in fact it frustrates many of our white sympathizers that Aboriginal people are still so kind and prepared to accept white people on their own terms. So far all I've had is the, the crumbs that drop from the white man's table and, I've, uh, and Aborigines basically have had secondary rewards more or less. I'm not don't want to denigrate all the hard work put in by the Aboriginal people and their white supporters who got the vote for Aborigines and so on, but uh, the Aborigines have to win a place in modern Australia and they have to develop the sort of organisation uh, that will enable them to do that. In the past 15 years, extraordinary changes have begun to happen in Australia. The nation on the other side of the frontier has risen from its deathbed and has begun to fight back. And what a spectacle it is. As the first Australians challenge some of the greatest transnational companies in the world, and governments, and historians, and assumptions and attitudes, and disease and neglect, in order that they may claim back their share of the oldest continent, their country. This film is a glimpse of their epic story. When Captain Cook landed here in Botany Bay, he was under orders not to raise the Union Jack without the consent of the inhabitants of Australia. But Cook and Captain Arthur Phillip, who followed with the first fleet of convicts, both disobeyed these instructions. And what followed was one of the darkest and least known periods in the history of Britain's empire. The British declared Australia an empty land, in spite of the fact that there were tribes with a total population of at least 300,000 perhaps as many as a million. No one knew exactly, because the first Australians were not counted as human beings. Decimation was swift. Aboriginal blood carried no resistance to white disease. Lieutenant Brady, Royal Marines, reported in 1788, from the great number of dead natives found in every part of Sydney Harbour, it appears that the smallpox has made dreadful havoc among them but not nearly as much havoc as massacre. No British colony was born under so cruel a star as Australia. The early convict ships had brought thousands of white slaves, mostly English and Irish, transported for crimes of poverty and politics. 
and they became the instruments of massacre, directed by Christian gentlemen who had brought with them attitudes of racial superiority that were the staple of empire. Ironically, their cruelty was at odds with liberal reformers in Britain who were then seeking to end the slave trade. In 1837, a House of Commons Select Committee condemned the atrocities against the Aborigines. But the difference between sympathy and action was a convenient 15,000 miles. I think it's a very calculating attitude which, which makes an entire nation of people write out 200 years of history um, and, and, and then speak only about imperial history. They speak about the pioneers, the brave white pioneers, the brave women who settled the country as if we didn't ever exist. And all of that history is based also on, on the legal fiction which established for them that they legitimately owned this country. They call it terra nullius. In other words, empty continent. The law says that we did not exist in 1788. Therefore, the continent was empty, uninhabited wasteland, and therefore the British had a right to occupy it. So you see, there have never been treaties here because we didn't exist legally to sign a treaty with them. The Aborigines were deemed to be subhuman, little more than animals, which was to justify not only the theft of their land, but their extermination. An edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica still in circulation when I was at school, described them as only an animal of prey, more ferocious than the leopard or the hyena, he devours his own species. So they were hunted and raped and massacred. And few doubted at the time that genocide was official policy. A government report in the 1850s spoke of the success of poisoning Aborigines, 100 of them laid out at a time. But until quite recently, little of this was even acknowledged. In Tasmania, the Aborigines were said to have died out. In fact, they were hunted along with kangaroos and almost wiped out. In New South Wales, by 1845, the tribe who had watched Captain Cook sail here into Botany Bay was reduced to three women and a man. In Victoria, an Aborigine called old Mr. Burt recalled this story told by his mother. They buried our babies with only their heads above the ground. All in a row they were. Then they had a test to see who could kick the baby's heads off the furthest. One man clobbered a baby's head off from horseback. They then spent most of the day raping the women. Most of them were then tortured to death by sticking sharp things like spears up their vaginas until they died. They tied the men's hands behind their backs then cut off their penis and testicles and watched them run around screaming until they died. One of the most enduring myths about the Aborigines is that they did not fight back. In fact, a war of resistance lasted more than a century, some of it here on the banks of the Hawkesbury River, north of Sydney. During the 1930s, my father built a cottage here on the beach at an Aboriginal place called Patonga. I think we knew that somebody had lived at Batonga at some time, but no one talked about it. In fact, an entire nation had lived here on and off for thousands of years. They were called the Jurag, a unique Aboriginal people, tall and slender, whose country extended to a 40-mile radius north of Sydney, and the mighty Hawkesbury River was theirs. And when the British established the town of Windsor in the early 1800s, a great war began. This war was not recorded in the Imperial Chronicles of Australia. Growing up here, I knew nothing about it, and I suspect that's still true of the people in the smart beach houses here today. And yet the Durag inflicted on the British a casualty rate greater than that sustained by the Australian Armed Forces during all of World War II. And finally, after 22 years, outnumbered and without guns, they went down fighting to the last man, woman and child, a complete nation. Today, in a land of many cenotaphs and war memorials, on which invariably is written, lest we forget, not one of them stands for those who fought and fell in their own country.
By the 1920s, the British invasion had caused the deaths of at least a quarter of a million black Australians. Genocide on a massive scale. But this fact remained suppressed, except in the living memory of those who survived. Here in the Northern Territory, in the great isolated heartland of Australia, the killing of Aborigines continued well into the 20th century, and most of these also remain secret. However, in 1928, 150 miles from Alice Springs, a gang of police and cattlemen massacred at least 50 Aborigines, perhaps many more, and word got out. A public inquiry was held, and its findings were summarized in these three words. The shooting was justified. In giving evidence, Constable William Murray said, we shot to kill. What use is a wounded black fella a hundred miles from civilization? Indeed, in the 1930s, there were massacres around here. And in Queensland, they were called nigger hunts. And I've heard white men only five years ago recalling their days in the nigger hunts. Um, and yes, they justified murdering us because we didn't use the land the way they did. And as, as I say, it was an utterly calculating attitude. They wanted our land, and to get our land, they had to get rid of us. We had pride in the land because, you know, we have all our sacred sites, we have all our things in there. We live by the land. We don't go and destroy the land. The land is our mother. That's what we believe in. And if it's going to be taken away from us, it's like taking, you know, taking someone's life away. If the non-Aboriginal people of Australia are willing to learn some of my grandfather's meaning for this country, then that may be able to give them some understanding what this really Australia is, what the history of Australia. Ned Kelly was only yesterday, you know, William the Conqueror was only yesterday. We got stories going back million, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The uniqueness of the Australian past has been concealed. In the dream time of the Aborigine, the land is sacred, the beginning and end of life itself. The European attitude to land, that of a commodity to be bought and sold, built on and exploited, is incomprehensible to a black Australian. This is the Obiri Rock, a cathedral of the spirit, east of Darwin. The significance of these paintings was only understood by Europeans as recently as the 1950s and 60s. These pictures were painted more than 10,000 years before the pyramids. They are older and more sophisticated than the cave paintings in France, by which the European tribes have measured their civilization. The World Heritage List now recognizes them as the oldest expression of human creativity. In other words, the longest historical record of any human beings. In recent years, white historians have made contact with people whose oral history includes record of the eruption of volcanoes 5,000 years ago. Many Australians are unaware of this. To them, the Aborigine is merely an object of pity, the poor old Abo. Many only see the frontier from their jumbo jet on its way to Singapore and London, although every summer they may feel it as winds from the deserts bring fires like this. These fires are unpredictable. They devastate the rural landscape and they reach into corners of gentility and incinerate without argument. Perhaps these fires, like the great droughts and floods, are reminders of the true nature of a country in which the majority of people may only be interlopers. The Aborigines not only survived, they developed a unique society and culture which those Europeans tied to racial stereotypes never saw or never acknowledged. Aborigines were presumed to be primitive and passive, at best noble savages, but none of this was true. In this ritual dance, for instance, the essence is humor, a put on. In fact, they were more sophisticated than the invaders. They learnt languages better, they understood the environment better, and the civilized value of their one family society often remained a puzzle to Europeans who were hardly civilized themselves coming from a background of class division and brutal poverty.
One European observer wrote that generosity seems so fundamental to the blacks that they have no word for thank you, nor do they have any concept of the extremes of wealth and poverty, nor were they able to fathom the invader's idea of equality, that of freedoms negotiated between elites. The native Australians wrote a colonial official in 1841, are a nation owning no chief, literally a pure democracy. A Victorian clergyman wrote, the Aborigines don't seem to understand exalted rank. In fact, it's difficult to get into a blackfellow's head that one man is higher than another. In 1965, the non-people revolted. A young Aborigine called Charlie Perkins led both blacks and white students on freedom rides into the outback. The idea had come from the freedom rides into the segregated southern states of America in the early 60s, and this town, Moree, New South Wales, might well have been Selma, Alabama. Life was divided racially at almost every level. Here at the public swimming pool where black children were banned, Perkins and his freedom riders were confronted by an angry white crowd. Then a black woman stepped forward and made a courageous speech in which she pointed to white men who had gone secretly with black women and had fathered black children. Tell your wives what you've been doing, she said. Go on, they're just over there, tell them. That evening, black children were allowed into the swimming pool. The fight back had begun. In 1967, a referendum was held which allowed the Aborigines to be counted as citizens in their own country. They could own property. They could get a job without permission, at least on paper. And they could vote. But for whom? For what? Political regimes in states like Queensland and Western Australia remained deaf to them. But what was changing, and dramatically, was the attitude of Aborigines themselves, many of whom now refused to play the part of mere victims in order to merit white sympathy and charity. Black Australians have tried many times to bring their case to the world, but their cry could not compete with the image of the lucky country. In 1982, the Commonwealth Games were held in Brisbane, Queensland, and the assembled international media heard ordinary, dignified voices of black Australia, a nation they had not known existed. Everyone else here today has, has brought along their flags uh, of their country. And we're doing exactly the same thing. We're promoting our flag, the flag that we've chosen to, uh, to follow, and we're displaying that. And there's no harm that, uh, in, in doing exactly that. And we're going to sit it out quietly like the rest of them, enjoy the games, but display our flag, and that's what we're doing. Around this time, the then Australian Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser, was building a reputation as a champion of black rights in Southern Africa. For the Aborigines, this presented a familiar irony. The Fraser government had consistently refused to use its federal power against repressive states like Queensland, whose Premier accused communists of disturbing his otherwise happy poor old abos. The truth was that the days of the poor old abo had gone forever. I am calling a corroboree of all the natives of New South Wales to send a petition to the King in an endeavour to improve our condition. All the black man wants is representation in federal parliament. There is also plenty of fish in the river for us all, and land to grow all we want. 150 years ago, the Aboriginals owned Australia, and today he demands more than the white man's charity. He wants the right to live. At that time, the 1930s, the Protection Acts were in full force. The chief protector had the power to send mixed-blood children to missions, having wrenched them away from their Aboriginal mothers. In this way, the mothers could continue to serve their white masters, the masters were saved any possible embarrassment, and the children were civilised with Christian ritual. If any Aborigine objected to this arrangement, the chief protector could imprison him or her without trial, all of which, said the law, was to save the natives from being overwhelmed by the white race. In recent years, many of those children sent to the missions have tried to find their families. Well, the first time with me, as the story goes, is my grandpa said, you don't take that kid, you know, so I was left. He stopped him, but then a little, the following year, 
a month later, he came back again, and then I was out with some other kids, and most of the old people had, had gone away from the station. And so Constable Bill McKinnon was able to take me, put me on the camel, and take me, you know, till people realised the day after, or the two days after, that I'd, I was missing. Yeah. I got European blood in me. My grandfather, my European grandfather, he, come, he, come, he is Scotsman. He come from Stockton and Tees somewhere, in England, somewhere there. He come over, around the border up there. He come here. And he had Aboriginal wives, and he gave his children then his name, my grandfather. But the policeman, under the simulation laws in this time, he's going to grab all us grab my mother's and all that there and put them in a compound because they were half European or whatever or something like that. <laughs> they put them in a compound. And my old granny, my old black granny, she'll come up there and try to talk to us, but we weren't allowed to. She'd get put in jail or I'd be getting threatened to send up to places like Melbourne and Croker Island. The officials came for us with a policeman in the car and my mother said, you're not taking them. He said, well, I'll have to use this if you don't patting his, the case with the handcuffs in it, you know. But we, in our childish imagination, we thought it was a gun. And uh, could we both yell them together, we'll go, we'll go, Mum, we'll go, you know. And, uh, and uh, he was very kind. He tried to be, you know, very kind. And he, my mother said, well, I'm going too. And uh, he still had her apron on and went 25 miles to the Niloquin, and uh, we weren't there very long when the car took us then to Finlay and on the train to Kutamandra at the train. Well, I heard years later how my mother cried and cried and she went out, she had nowhere to go, and she went out into the bush and my old aunt and them who were told of me as they were coming past a certain point right out on the outskirt of the Nelequin, they heard us moaning like an animal, you know, and they stopped the buggy and went over to see, and they discovered not that it was my mother lying under this tree and in the tall grass crying. She couldn't mo moaning, she couldn't cry anymore, you know, and uh, they had to care for her and look after her, but we were already on our own the way you all might have been in Kutamandra then, by then, you know, by train. But I often wonder how many other children were taken like that, just like animals, because our hearts were absolutely broken. In January 1972, four young blacks set up a tent on the lawns of federal parliament in Canberra and called it the Aboriginal Embassy. Again and again, the police tore it down, and again and again, the Aborigines put it back up, all of which was embarrassing to a conservative coalition government, which found itself explaining to inquiring foreigners the symbolism of an Australian embassy in Australia. It was a brilliant idea which focused a national campaign for land rights and helped to concentrate minds in the Australian Labour Party, 
a Labour government was elected for the first time in 23 years. It was the first Australian government committed to a policy not of whether there ought to be justice for the Aborigines, but how. Prime Minister Gough Whitlam set up a commission which laid down principles for land rights legislation. In effect, the beginning of real self-determination. One of Whitlam's last political acts was to go to the land of the Gurindji people and become the first white leader to give back a piece of Australia to the first Australians. Feud against the nightmare that had gone before, the Aboriginal renaissance that unfolded during the 1970s was extraordinary. These are but a few who became public names. Pat O'Shane, first Aboriginal woman barrister, first head of a government department. Charlie Perkins, freedom rider, now head of the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. Mick Miller, pioneer community leader, eloquent foe of Queensland politicians. Kevin Gilbert, poet and author of the first major political work by an Aborigine. Kevin Cook, a pioneer of Aboriginal cooperative training. Essie Coffey, award-winning filmmaker from New South Wales. Justin Saunders, an outstanding stage and screen actress. Marwil Yantelaway, celebrated star of many feature films. David Gulpalil, film actor and dancer extraordinary. Self-determination is happening in many ways. This is Central Australia Aboriginal media, the first radio network to be run by and for Aborigines in their own languages. At the beginning, it was they couldn't believe that it was happening. I've, I'd seen people cry when we first showed them how to um, find our, our um, radio, sta you know, our station on the dial. Uh, I, I spent the first few weeks we were on air just going around the fringe camps, showing people if they got a radio where, where, where they found it on the dial, and the people were just so overwhelmed. Um, but to hear their own language. To, to hear their own language on the radio. Well, good afternoon, Malamanda. Now the people of Malamanda are quite a bit. Our time is seven minutes past one. And now the Gali Burman film of Film Gujuram, the Gali Kundan Jay. In 1986, a new television satellite will beam all the great milestones of Western civilization to the outback. Dallas, this is your life, sale of the century. From the coming of the first settlers and their sheep to the miners and their bulldozers, the Aborigines have lost out. With the coming of this new satellite, will a venture such as this be smothered and they lose out again? The same determination that is keeping alive ancient languages has produced from virtually nothing in 1970 Aboriginal councils that are democratically based and legal and medical services that are informal, accessible and truly part of the Aboriginal community. The long-term goal is self-determination and the obstacle is um, what we call the Aboriginal industry. There are so many white people in Aboriginal affairs doing things that we can do, running our communities when our communities can run them themselves, um, and, and so that it seems almost impossible at the moment to do anything about that. But if you take a long-term view, we've come a long way in terms of achieving self-determination on the ground in running our own communities and organisations and in um, convincing Aboriginal people that they can do it, that one doesn't have to be reliant on the long socks. It's like big brother watching, <laughs> you know. Look, you do the right thing. If you don't, I'll cliff you under the ears, you know. So, our big white brothers prefer that we stick under their rules. Mm. Their rules? Their rules. Do you think there'll ever come a time where you'll, you'll have your own rules? <laughs> 
Well, I don't care what rule they got. I've got my rule in my sacred site where I keep and I'm proud of it. The Walperi people of the Northern Territory have transformed this former mission at Bamili into their own community with a bus, a clinic and a school where the first black teachers are qualifying. I'm listening on the radio. Radio. Yeah, I'm listening on the radio, radio yeah. Radio. And where are you going then? Where are you reckon I'm going? You're going to look like chicken. Then I'm going to... 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 Well, here, let us pick you. Yeah, what are you doing? I'm going to... 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 I'm what about this picture here? Buckingham Palace, scenes of Christmas snow. Education here is still white controlled and has yet to look to the other side of the frontier, while the blacks are still asked to make all the compromises. At least they're no longer being taught that Captain Cook found them. Do that again. Point to the word Christmas. Far west of here are other resurgent communities where there are no compromises. These are known as outstations where Aborigines run their own cattle and are self-supporting. There's little welfare, no TV and no alcohol. Several of them have shortwave radio and their own airstrips. Twenty years ago, such a choice would have been unthinkable. At Yipirinya School near Alice Springs, the children of people who were once forced off their land by squatter farmers are taught their origins such as the gathering of traditional food known as bush tucker, kangaroo, witchetty grub, wild onions. And this is how others regard the land. For the Aborigines, the history of mining in Australia is the story of brutal eviction without compensation. For example, at Mapoon in Queensland, the Aborigines refused to leave when the Queensland government awarded a lease to the giant Camelco company for bauxite mining. So armed police landed after dark, arrested the entire community, and burnt their homes, their church, their school and shops. That was 1963. There's no film record. Such atrocities were not news then. But by 1980, the Aborigines were waiting and organized. So much so that the police had to escort a drilling rig 1,500 miles to a sacred site at Nuncombah in Western Australia. What was significant about this was the white popular support for the Aborigines, which raises a universal question. Is it possible for the haves to restore to the have-nots an honoured place in their nation's history? What is tantalizing about these events in Australia is that the answer to that question is not predetermined, not yet, and that there still seems a possibility for reconciliation between people of the first and third worlds sharing one country. In some respects, Australia denies itself sovereignty, for it's the most foreign owned of any developed country. So what does land rights really mean? Who really owns Australia? This is freehold land owned by most ordinary Australians. That is the 90% who live in suburban towns and cities. And this is land leased by the pastoralists, many of them large foreign companies and farmers whose forebears squatted on land in the 19th century. These are national parks where the wildlife can only be shot with a camera. And this is vacant crown land, nothing to do with the royal family it's land owned by the state and federal governments. And this is the land that the Aborigines have won back as a result of limited legislation in the 1970s. Most of it is barren desert, the kind of land whites don't want. Unless, of course, there's something rich underneath it. We've got wastelands, wetlands, all swamps and all this type of business. And also, we own the Great Simpson Desert, we own the, uh, the stony desert over here, we own only deserts and wastes and wetlands, that's all we own. Yeah. And also, in South Australia, we own a place, what they call Maralinga lands. Now we all, the infamous Maralinga, you know, that's all polluted with pl plutonium and, and all the byproducts of uranium. Australia has the distinction of being the only country in the world 
to have supplied uranium for nuclear bombs, which its leaders allowed to be dropped by a foreign power on their own territory and their own people without warning. In the 1940s, the British were looking for somewhere to explode their new nuclear weapons. The central and western deserts of Australia were said to be ideal. Dr. Keith Locum, director of the Australian Radiation Laboratory said, there was the view in the back of everybody's mind that the land was unoccupied and likely to remain so. This view ignored the fact that an entire Aboriginal nation had lived on the land since before the arrival of Captain Cook. British history was conveniently repeating itself. More than 160 years earlier, all of Australia had been declared an empty land. At Maralinga and Emu Junction, between 1952 and 57, nine nuclear bombs were exploded. Yami Lester was 12 at the time. His people received no warning. This was early in the morning. I was up playing. It might have been around about 7. The sun was coming up. And it was a warm morning. And um, we heard this bang. And um, old people saying something and when I heard the bang and I just went on playing with other kids see? the black smoke come over and that's what with dust storm but was too quiet for dust storm and that this this rolling above the trees then pass over and then after that I don't know how many days after but most of the people were sick and uh, we all got um, um, skin rash and diarrhea and sore eyes and uh, red red eyes and you couldn't open it and or you open it and it was hurting and you know tears and that all that and uh, I believe that some people died because of um, we didn't have any proper treatment, you know, there's no white doctors or white nurses there. That's happened, I think, 1953. Then, uh, 57, I went blind then. In Britain and Australia, a propaganda campaign was mounted to justify the tests. This was the news of the world in May 1957. Tests will harm no one. In the Daily Express, Chapman Pincher wondered who were the real opponents of Britain's harmless bomb tests. Could it be those who hate or envy the British? Could it be Jap business tycoons who are using underhand methods to beat Britain in the export markets? For many years, the Aboriginal people tried to tell the world what had really happened in Australia, but few listened. It was only when British and Australian servicemen who had worked on the tests began to suffer and die from cancers that the full horror of the bombs began to emerge. Finally, in 1984, the Australian government agreed to a Royal Commission. Patrick Connolly, who served at Maralinga with the Royal Air Force, said, occasionally we would bring the Aborigines in for decontamination. Other times, we just shoot them off like rabbits. Australia has offered its sovereignty to other countries while denying it to the Aborigines. The Americans today have a number of spy bases which are theirs to do as they wish. Here is the American ambassador accepting one of the bases almost as right. Now our friendly Australian landlords haven't yet demanded their rent. But we Americans want to always be good tenants. We want you to know that we pay our bills promptly. Here then, Mr. Prime Minister, I want to present you with one peppercorn payment in full for the first year's rent. I thank you very much. Near Alice Springs and its sacred <laughs> Aboriginal sites is the Pine Gap base, which tells the Americans what the Russians are doing in Europe. Not surprisingly, the Russians have indicated that Pine Gap is a prime nuclear target. A peppercorn is therefore a bargain price to pay for positioning Australia in the front line of a nuclear war on the other side of the world. The Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, 
has projected himself, or rather his media image, as truly a man of all the people. Indeed, when he came to power, his Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, Clyde Holding, spoke of land rights as a restitution for white Australia's genocidal past, a final healing of the wounds. A National Land Rights Act was to be drafted at last, one it was hoped without strings to snatch the land back. But mining was the catch. During the 1984 election campaign, powerful mining interests conduct an openly racist campaign which included TV commercials with a black wall built across Western Australia. In October, in the critical weeks before the election, the state's Labour Premier, Brian Burke, met Prime Minister Hawke. They talked about the problem of land rights and marginal seats and of being fair to mining interests. After the meeting, Hawke effectively cancelled Labour Party policy, which would have given Aborigines the right to control resources on their own land. A starring role is said to be Bob Hawke's dream for the 1988 bicentenary celebrations, which for the Aborigines may well be a nightmare. This was Botany Bay in 1970. On the other side of the water, the Whites were celebrating yet again the coming of Captain Cook. At the next celebrations, the Aborigines may not be satisfied simply with expressing their grief. Well, every 26th of January I mourn in my heart because as far as my experience with colonisation, I've pretended outwardly it's good. I've learned to speak the language that I was taught. I've learned to dress and live the way that made other people happy. But I, I had to sacrifice my desires, my ways, my culture. You can go ahead and celebrate your 200 years, whatever, settlements. I'm just going to wander down, down the bush and do what I want to do. Well, I don't see how Aborigines could uh, have anything but antipathy towards the 1988 uh, celebrations unless their sovereignty in, in this country uh, had been assured. I mean, what, uh, how on earth could uh, Aborigines come to the party at all? When are we going to celebrate justice? <laughs> you know, when are we going to celebrate just, just giving back what was uh, taken wrongfully? It comes down to this. Aboriginal people will not survive unless we have real land rights, and that means having control over our land. The right to refuse entry to outsiders, the right to say no to mining if we have to, if we feel that it's too dangerous, um, and so on. We have to have that kind of control. If we don't have that control, it means the end of the longest living human culture and religion on this planet. That's what it means. Nobody likes to see somebody lying down and taking it. The average Australian would give a lot of support to the Aboriginal groups who really be, uh, who are going to stand up and take the fight uh, to the powers that be to establish uh, a very significant Aboriginal Australia. And uh, there'd be many, there'd be, uh, it'd be a, the battle lines would be drawn up, but there'd be a lot of white Australians uh, uh, on the side of Aborigines who attempt to do this. Is this perhaps the, the kind of national crusade that seems to have been lacking in this country for quite a long time? How could it be possible with the people so decimated with such, over such a vast area? Decimated first by disease, then subjected to a systematic and uh, not so systematic genocide in various parts. How could it be otherwise with the numbers so small and with the uh, distractions and the forces against them so great? But when, uh, when it does emerge, it should be, uh, there'll be many uh, people in Australia ready to help it. In your lifetime, do you think? I hope so. I hope so, yeah. Are you hopeful or pessimistic uh, about a reconciliation between white and black Australians? I uh, can't comment on that at the moment. You're not sure? Not sure. Mm. Otherwise, I'd be telling you lies. <laughs>
In a momentous vote in 1967, almost 90% of the Australian electorate gave the federal government special powers to legislate justice for the Aboriginal people. It was the greatest majority in Australian political history. And since then, some justice, some rights, some land, and some pride have been won back. And yet in this rich country, Aboriginal children remain sick and malnourished, and their death rate from simple, preventable disease is not very different from that of children in poor countries in Africa and Asia. This almost incredible situation is not a medical problem, but a political one. And the obstacles to overcoming it stem not from malevolence, but from a lack of political will to match sympathy with action. Support for the underdog has always been a powerful myth in Australia, in a white society with the humblest of origins. And like many myths, it's partly true. Radical reforms like voting rights, minimum wage and childcare legislation were pioneered in Australia. But when do the benefits of this noble and fragile tradition reach those whose extraordinary generosity of spirit has been expressed in this film? And what will happen in 1988 when 200 years of European settlement is celebrated? What version of events will be told then? An acceptable version, a compromised version, or the secret truth. It seems to me that until a committed policy of reconciliation, of real nationhood, is offered to the first Australians, those who came recently can never claim their own.